um, I'm sad to be the final person. So the, the, the first I just want to mention one thing about undersaving, and then I'll get to the, the, the paper that I'm presenting. So you know, a, lot of, a lot of studies these days have been centered around how to get people to save. And we, I think it helps to start by taking one step back um, to you know, ask the question, what do we actually mean by undersaving? It's almost like this presumption that people undersave. You know, it's not to say that there isn't some things that we can point to that kind of indicate, you know, kind of in very touchy-feely ways, questions like, would you like to save more and things like this. But I never know really what to do with those questions because, of course, it's hard to separate a question of, would you like to have more savings from, would you like to have more money? Right, um, and which always reminds me of one of my favorite lines ever from The Simpsons. Um, are people here familiar with The Simpsons, or is this too much of an American culture thing? When um, does nodding mean too familiar? Yeah. Okay. When um, the drunk turns to Montgomery Burns and says, "Mr. Burns, you're the w richest man I know." To which Montgomery Burns responds, "Yeah, but I'd give it all up in a moment for just a little bit more." <laughs> So, um, so what do we actually mean by, by undersaving? And let me just, I'm just throwing out some, some general points here, and, and then I'll jump into the, the paper that we did. The first is, you know, it helps to kind of break it off into supply side, demand side, and also think about behavioral failures versus market, more traditional economic market failures. So on the supply side, we might think that we have undersaving if the, the banking regulatory system, for instance, doesn't, doesn't have proper prudence um, in regulatory policies. I don't think many people point to that. At least I don't see too much in the literature that points to that as a true failure on a large scale. Um, the fixed cost, though, is a big issue. Right? So the fact that, the, fact that p the poor in really rural areas don't actually have physical access to a safe place to put their money, and the fixed cost for a bank of setting up a branch in a rural area is obviously um, quite high. And so that actually causes um, lack of access to banking services. So this is one area where mobile banking and cell phone banking has become you know, uh, very popular for some. But on the demand side is, is really where most of the emphasis has been and most of the focus of, of the research. Um, in, in some sense, I think, compared to that fixed cost one, it's kind of interesting that we've all been focused on the, first, on, on the demand side. When I'm willing to bet, if we did a show of hands, like what's going to be more important to getting people to save, solving you know kind of time inconsistent preferences, getting people's attention on savings, which is what this paper will be about, or making it so that they don't actually have transaction costs to make deposits, right? So that they don't have to tra travel an hour to a bank to make a deposit; they can actually do it more quickly. Like, raise your hand if you think the first set, the behavioral stuff, is as a magnitude in terms of how much if we solve both problems, which one is going to have a bigger impact. I'm just curious. Raise your hand if you think the behavioral stuff will have a bigger impact. What, what about the just getting transaction costs down to zero to actually physically make a deposit? So I'm actually surprised. Why would you think behavioral would be bigger than the other? Maybe we can leave this for the discussion period. I mean, I consider myself a behavioral economist, but I would put the first. I would have raised my hand on the second one. Having said that, all the work is on the first. It's a little more interesting. <laughs> um, but. Um, but, so I just want to lay that out there and make that point kind of um, clear that we need to think through what, what are the various what constraints. Now, on the, on the individual side, when we think about the, um, what we mean by under savings, you know, at least I kind of broadly put it into three different categories, either some individual failure, so this goes at what, what um, Dean was just talking about. God, that always feels weird to say. Um, the second... Uh, you know, or, or what I'm about to talk about, which has to do with attention. Uh, um, a second is on social constraints, right? Which, which Dean also talked about some. So, you know, I'm not talking about anything, anything beyond that. You know, spousal control, family control, neighbors, things of this nature. Um, the third is paternalistic, right? And maybe, maybe that is what some people are actually saying when they say there's undersaving, which is that people themselves are behaving perfectly rational given their preferences, but we just think their preferences should be different and we're being paternalistic, and we think they should be saving up more for education. Um, OK, so when we, when we break down into the individual failure setting, 
we have a, a few different categories of things which I think are, are driving most of the conversation and most of the experimentation and toying with product designs and processes to nudge people along to better behavior. And I put them into three broad categories here. A first set that has to do with temptation and models of dual self and hyperbolic preferences. A second has to do with false optimism. And, and expectations about the future and information about the future. And the third has to do with attention. Uh, attention could be attention to your future income. It could be attention to future expenses, of attention to the tasks that are necessary in order to complete certain processes. So that's the, the broad set of things that fall under attention. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So this, pro this project is joint with Maggie McConnell at um, Harvard School of Public Health, Sendel, who is um, probably not here to listen to his own work, understandably, um, and Jonathan Zinman, who is at Dartmouth. So I'm going to go really quickly through some of this, because a lot of this we've already been talking about. And Dean already said some of these very points. Um, <coughs> and the, the, main, the main starting point we had here was a recognition that, that you know, we've, we've been very focused on these anomalies in intertemporal choice, and there's been different work that's both observational, like, the first, like papers from the United States that look at household data and patterns that people have in terms of borrowing and saving in the United States, and, and calibrate models that, that do have some sort of time inconsistent preferences in them in order to try to explain people's behavior. Uh, we have the work that, that we did in the Philippines um, with Nava, who is already has left as well. No, no, stayed here. <laughs> um, um, that was on that the dean also was referring to back in his in his talk, and and we have a wide body of, of theoretical papers that use different types of formulations but have the same basic underlying prediction that that there's going to be some change in behavior between now and the future. And, and here's the kicker for all of those models, regardless of what formulation they're using, whether it's a model of dual self, a model of temptation, hyperbolic preferences, they all have a same prediction, which is that we would like to somehow restrict our future choices. We somehow want to change the choices we're facing in the future and take some things away. And that's a common prediction of all of them, is that preference for a commitment device of some form that you want to in some way make the thing that you want to not do more expensive, make your, make your vices more expensive or your virtues cheaper. And that's a, that's a common theme throughout them. So what we're doing here is saying, is looking at, it, at putting forward a different model that's very simple. It's not intended to be a model that is going to rock your world. It's just going to be a model that makes the very simple point that we can generate some key results simply through thinking about how people pay attention to future expenditures. Okay, and, um, and the key here is that we're going to basically make the same predictions about under savings through this model, and, and that it also lends itself very practically to understanding how reminders, and, per and in particular different types of reminders, are going to influence savings behavior. One key thing that is important to note, and this is one of the punchlines of the, the model in terms of what we predict, is that, and, and, what we, and, and what other models do predict, if you look at models of temptation, of dual self, and all the hyperbolic preferences, all these models, they all would say that reminding people to save should have no impact on their behavior. Right. And, um, and so, you know, when we look at, and, that, and basically the short of what we've done here is in three different countries, we've sent people reminders to save, and it's led people to save more. Right, so we know from that that the, you know, we can't rely on the models of dual self to, to explain what's happening since they have, they're just agnostic to, to, um, to this issue of attention. Now, a, th a very important point we want to make clear here is we're not, we're not trying to beat down on the prior research on time and consistent preferences. I still like it very much. Um, we're, we're putting forward an alternative, which is an as well as type model, not as an in lieu of model, right? So there's obviously can be many different things going on at the same time to influence people's choices. And, and all, all we're doing here is putting forward a separate model, which is not, um, not, not intended to say the, the prior one is wrong, per se, um, but uh, it doesn't explain all of the phenomenon clearly. Okay, some of, there's some interesting work from psychology that does motivate some of our thinking here. Um, and in particular, it comes from some of um, two, different, two different areas. So for instance, if, if I asked you all to write down right now, take, imagine you're a, a paper that you're working on and, and estimate the number of hours it's going to take you to get that paper up to the point that you click go and submit and, and send it to a journal. 
Um, the, the, the debate, you know, there's been various research from psychology which does things like that and basically finds that people systematically will underestimate the total number of hours that it's going to take to complete that task. Right? But we can improve that estimation. We're not going to get it right to correct, but we can improve that estimation if I broke it down into pieces. And I asked you, how many hours will it take you to finish the bibliography, to finish the proofs, to finish the empirical work, the tables, the this, the that, the copy edited. And I added, and then you just did each little segment. You're going to get better, right? And, and one of the key things here is that we're not, you know, we're not always so good at, at thinking about all these, the, you know, kind of the, to, to, to quote our famous American philosopher Donald Rumsfeld, the, 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 the unknown unknowns, right, become very hard to kind of think about and how to add them all up and what to do with them, okay? So, um, so a similar experiment on this from psychology, which I always like, is this, the other category experiment. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this one, but it basically works very simply. A, a few different configurations of how to do it. But suppose that, um, suppose that you came back from the coffee break right now and, um, and I wasn't here. And then you're asked to write down on a piece of paper you know, to tell me the, the relative probability uh, that you think it is one of three things. And we divided the room up, and half of you got a list of three, and the other of you got a list of four. And your three things were, you know, option number one was, you know, I was sitting outside with somebody else talking and lost track of time. Option number two was some emergency happened with my family and I left. Um, and three was something else. Right? And the rest of you got the same first two, but then also for a third one, got an option of, I was in the other room, wondering where you all are. And then the fourth was other, right? And the point is that in a perfect world, right, the, the, the categories three and four, the I was in the other room plus other, should add up to the other for the other group of you. But it doesn't, right? We gave you, I gave you a specific idea of what's in there and, and the other, and it kind of, it, it took some probabilities from some of the other categories too, right? So when you give people very specific things, it, it, it increases the amount of things that you add to that. And so now, uh, attributing this to expense, thinking about this as future expenses, if I asked you all the things that you're going to need in, your, in the next year to, that you're going to spend money on, the point is that you're not going to think of everything. But the more I give you to remind you about some specific things, the closer you are going to get to the right answer. Okay, so that's, 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 the, that's the analogy that comes from the, the, the psych literature. Okay, so how's this model going to work? I'm going to just go over very, the, I'm not going to go over the details of the model, just the, the hand-waving. We have two types of consumption. We have a regular known consumption that you attend to perfectly, you remember perfectly, it does not change, it's unit one, it, it is throughout, and it is, it is um, there's no uncertainty. There's no uncertainty in this model whatsoever. Um, there is perfect borrowing and saving at the same interest rate in this model. Um, and, and the second thing you have is a lumpy expenditure that happens every single time period. It's it could be different every time period. And we're using the term expenditure to be very hand-waving on purpose, right? It could be an investment. It could be an expense. A, 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 you know, it, so, you know, it could be fertilizer. It could be school fees. It could be a car registration. It could be rent. It could be anything um, that's lumpy or an appliance for your house, things like that. So it could be anything It's lumpy in this model, just for simplicity. It's the same cost every time period, but it's different every time period what it is. And the kicker is that you don't always attend to them, okay? And so if you, I asked you right now, how many more of these are you going to have in the next month, in next year, and it's, let's say, time periods are one, you know, one time period per month, then you're going to, it's going to be some random number, and you're going to say, I, I, oh, I have seven of these coming up. Um, and if I ask you next month how many you're going to have, it's like you re-randomize which ones you remember, which ones you don't. So that's the basic model. And just, uh, again, for simplicity, and we can, you know, we can get more complicated and see how it changes things, but it'll, it'll only exacerbate most of the points of this, of this model when we add in things like uncertainty or, or a spread between borrowing and saving rates. So the kicker of this is, um, the second point of this is all, it, it has to do with um, the salience advantage of debt over savings. One of the earlier titles of the paper was the, the salience disadvantage of savings over debt. And what we mean by this is two things on both sides. Um, both, both, by both sides, I mean deposits and withdrawals. So think about the, the salience advantage of debt over savings when it comes to making payments. Why is debt salience advantaged? Well, because if you fail to remember, somebody else will. Okay? The bank, right? They'll remind you. 
They'll, 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 they'll make sure you don't forget forever. If you forget to save, right, bank's not going to hunt you down. Right? It might be that there's some consequence that eventually makes you remember it. We're not saying it's not like an all or nothing thing. Right? It's just an advantage. Same thing on the withdrawal side. Right? If you, why is debt savings advantage for making withdrawals? Why do you not need as much attention in order to, to use debt to help make large withdrawals? Well, because you don't. If you have the credit, if you have the line of credit, if you have liquidity, the local, whether it's a local money lender in a poor area or whether it's people like us with a credit card and a home equity line of credit, you don't have to be thinking about it. You just need to know that it has to be at the moment that you need to pull out the money, you give them your credit card. There it is. You don't need attention. It's there all the all, all time. Savings, on the other hand, if you failed to attend to it and all of a sudden you want to make a large withdrawal, well, if you didn't intend to it and the money's not there, then it's not there. It's not your friend anymore. Right? So, so the point of being on both sides, whether it's deposits or withdrawals, salient, the salience advantage goes to debt in both cases. So, so people who are attention um, deficient, so to speak, are going to find themselves using debt a lot more than, than savings for that reason. Now, there's some, um, there are overlaps with the models of self-control that are, are important, but the key here is where they, where they differ. And like I mentioned before, one of the key dif there's two key differences. One is that models of self-control make no prediction about whether reminders are going to help them or not, or whether they're going to change behavior. In fact, they just say it, it should have no, you know, it, it's, it's, it's agnostic, basically, to it. Um, if one, one could get into a model of self-control that was like a stochastic model of self-control where it came and went, and then, then, then one could make that into a model where, where a reminder would actually influence behavior. The second, though, is our model of attention says that the, we make no prediction about demand for commitment, right? Yet we do see that there's that evidence of demand for commitment savings accounts. So we're not, we're not, again, we're not saying there shouldn't be. We're just agnostic to that. And again, it just goes to the point that we're not trying here to put up a model, um, put up an idea that is taking down models of self-control control type issues and time inconsistent preferences, we're just putting forward an alternative that, ha that is an as well as not in lieu of type, type thinking. Okay. Ah, so here's an example of just the market supply reminders, right? It's not like this idea of reminders came out of nowhere. We do see this a lot. Um, so this is a reminder for, for getting your car registered in, in Massachusetts. Um, banks, like I, I know my bank in the United States, when I log in, I always get a little thing that says, do you want to have, do you want to sign up for a nice little reminder service for savings and things like that? So um, let me skip through some of this. So here's just a couple, two little graphs that give you the heart of why this generates under savings, but hopefully it's fairly intuitive. So the first key thing to note is that we're not, um, we're not making a statement, that our model is agnostic to what actually happens on your expenditures as a consequence of failure to attend to your future expenditure. So think about two, state, two different worlds, one in which you're, you have low marginal utility for your future expenditures and one in which you have high. Remember, the expenditure is the term I'm using for the thing that you may or may not attend to, whereas consumption is the thing that happens every time period. So if you have low marginal utility per expenditure, in this, uh, in this little graph, we have three time periods. And, and here in time period, this is the fully attentive person. The person just wants perfectly smooth consumption throughout, takes their one, their one expenditure for every time period, they, they do that, and then they smooth their consumption. Right? But in, in time period one, if they're forgetting about one of the future time period expenditures, then they're going to bump up their consumption by a little bit because they're only remembering one of these two. So they basically bump this up by half because they get one, you know, one expense in the future that they're forgetting they're going to need, and so they take that they, and, they, and they spend some of it here. Actually, it should be a third, I'm sorry, because they're going to spread it out across the three time periods. But in this little graph, what happens here is they get to time period two, and, and now something happens, and now it's, they're attending to it. And they're like, ooh, I forgot. I have this thing I'm supposed to pay, and I have to decide whether to do it or not. Now, in this, in this example, we're saying they get low marginal utility per expenditure. So what's going to happen, they're going to say, yeah, I forgot about it. I was going to, I was going to, I said I was going to do fertilizer, but I forgot. So now I'm not going to do fertilizer, right? I recognize it's a good thing to do, but it's not that good. I prefer to, I prefer my food than my fertilizer. So what happens is I, on my time period three, which is when that, that lumpy expenditure happens, I, I, I don't do it and that's where utility falls. Okay, so I, I actually keep my consumption up. 
I stop that expenditure and I continue to spread out that, consum that expenditure money that was going to be spent on the expenditure across my consumption for the three time periods. Now, you know, in the other scenario where the, you, uh, there's high marginal utility for that expenditure, now I attend to it and now the only loss comes from failure to have smooth consumption. So that's the only loss in utility from here. Right, so now I, I all of a sudden remember I had this thing, I was supposed to do it, I'm going to do it, I, I do really want it, so I do it, but what ends up happening is I overconsumed in time period one, and so then I of course have to underconsume in time periods two and three, um, because, you know, uh, I, because of my, my budget constraint. So that's, you know, that, that's where the welfare loss happens in both of these cases, um, and under savings happens in both of these cases. Okay, so the basic two predictions here are going to be that reminders are going to increase the savings, but more specifically reminders that have something to say about the future, about what they're doing, about their future expenditures, should have even more power. Um, and um, so we have three field experiments we did in three countries. Um, there are three for-profit banks. I'm not going to go through all the nitty-gritties of each of the three, um, but I'll just tell you kind of broad strokes how they differ. Um, in all of them, we're dealing with somewhat lower to middle income households, you know, wealthy enough that they had a bank account or were willing to open a bank account at a, at a bank, but these are not, you know, this is not Citibank we're talking about. Um, and within those who signed up for these accounts, we randomly assigned reminders. In the Philippines and Bolivia, we send text messages. And in Peru, we send a physical letter. In Peru, we did this kind of early before cell phones really had taken off, and the penetration rate for cell phone was just simply too low. So there's really more of a thought exercise. There's no way that is cost effective for a bank to be sending a physical letter to remind people to make a monthly savings payment. Um, in in Philippines and Bolivia, the cost benefit analysis we did shows that it it, it, it comes through with. with with, you know, a, a huge green light. This is a very, very profitable thing for the banks to be doing, and in fact, they have continued to do it since the since the project ended. Um, and then the salience manipulations are intended to increase the association reminders with the future needs. That was only unfortunately done in Peru. We don't have that from all three of the sites. So there's some little variations that do differ across in terms of some of the other experimental variation that was taking place. Now, in each of the each of the accounts. There was some sort of goal going on. There was some sort of goal. There was like a, a goal savings account. There was a plan. You have to make a savings deposit every month for a year. Um, and then at the end of the year, if you succeeded in achieving your plan of making each of your savings deposits, then you got some reward. So like in Peru, the, the interest rate increased from 4 to 8% if you completed your goal. In Bolivia, it was a similar increase in interest rate, plus you also got this life insurance policy. Um, in the Philippines, there is different, um, different, different things that that part was actually randomized as part of a separate project, the, the actual reward. So some people got a reward for achieving their goals, some people did not. Um, but in each of the cases, there was kind of a terminal end to the, to the design, which is one of the unfortunate things in terms of what our limits to what we can do in this study, because I can't tell you what happens to like the five-year behavior, since really the construct of this account was that it was a one-year account and they were supposed to do this stuff for one year and then, and then that's it. Um, it's not to say that it couldn't carry over to some future account, become, but it becomes much harder for us to know what account to look at to see whether the behavior really changed in, in the long run or not. I'll get to that later. Um, so in the Philippines, we had a 23% take up of those offering, offered the account, 23% took up. The experiment is just then within the 23% that took up, we then randomize within there, who gets reminders, who does not. There's an important element to remember here, which is that, you know, there is a sample selection. These are individuals who have said they want to save, they want to open up this goal type savings account, and then we're testing within those people. Um, in, in the Philippines, there actually was a little bit of a commitment aspect to it, whereas in, the, in Bolivia and the Peru, it was more, um, uh, it was really just more of a program savings account. It wasn't, it wasn't um, um, there was no restrictions on withdrawals and things. Um, okay, so, oh, and the other thing to note is just how they were marketed. In Peru and Bolivia, they were both marketed through an open marketing process, billboards, radio ads, things of this nature, people come into the bank and they open up their account. In the Philippines, it was marketed through a door-to-door -door process where there was marketing staff from the bank that just literally went to the doors of people in the communities and said, hi, I'm from First Valley Bank and I'm here to tell you about our savings accounts. Would you like to open an account? 
Um, so one of the reasons for the low take-up rate, the 23%, is that a lot of these people just weren't first Valley Bank clients, and so they're selling them not just on the idea of savings, but actually savings with this bank, and so they might have had bank accounts elsewhere and things like that. Okay, let me skip through some of this. So here's the punchline slide in terms of the impact results. How am I doing on time, by the way? What are we? Uh, 15 minutes. Okay. So the pooled sample, um, which is our preferred way of looking at the data, we don't really have any theory going in that said, oh, we expect this to work better in one country versus another based on some sort of cultural or economic reason. So the preferred sample is, is, is the top. Um, and we have a 6% increase from getting access to the, from, from receiving the reminders. Um, the two columns are differ only in terms of whether we include controls or not, just to show the robustness on this, whoops. Um, and a, as a binary outcome variable, just to see whether they actually reach their savings goal, because remember all of these accounts have some goal to them that they're supposed to save so much for the year and then be done. And so we see a three percentage point increase in the likelihood that they reach their goal if they receive the reminders. And that's off of a base success rate of about 55%. So we're talking 55 to 58%. Um, if we do break it up by country, you do see for whatever it's worth, the point estimates in the Philippines seems to be biggest on percents, whereas Bolivia is higher on the, the binary outcome variable. Um, I, like I said, I don't personally put too much weight on the, the breaking up by country. I'm happy to kind of pontificate on what the differences are, but they're not significant statistically, the differences across the countries. Um, so I don't personally think they're worthy of that much consideration, particularly since it's, it would be kind of, uh, at least in, in my view, a little bit of a theoryless search for, for differences. So the main results to remember in terms of the overall, and I'll get into this, one of the most interesting elements of heterogeneity we think we have in, in just a moment, but the overall to remember is the 6% and 3% numbers. And there's another caveat that I think is really important to put on here just in terms of the limitations of what we can say, and it has to do with the crowd out issue. You know, one of the, one of the biggest challenges in doing savings research, I think, in developing countries is, in particular in developing countries, is, is when we see savings accounts, balances go up, like the question then is, well, did, it, did savings go up or did people just move money around from one pocket to another? Right, this is one of the more challenging issues with the paper that, that we talked about earlier with NAVA from the Green Bank in the Philippines where we do find this huge increase in savings at the Green Bank. So not just in their commitment savings account, but in all accounts at the Green Bank we find savings goes up. But the question always kind of lurked behind us and it ate away at us a little bit of, well, did they just save less elsewhere? So we, you know, we did a follow-up survey. We have a further paper on that where we do try to measure savings elsewhere, it's, we don't find any, any crowd out, but it's also just a very noisy thing to try to measure. So we can look you know, most easily at financial institutions, but most people don't have multiple financial institutions. And so it's easy to show that that's probably not happening. But it's really hard to beat down the, you know, I have you know, one fewer chickens and I have one less goat. Thing, you know, things that are resellable assets that really form an informal savings vehicle effectively. And it's really hard to start getting into figuring out what their accounts as savings versus simply a household appliance and how are you going to now determine whether aggregate savings went up or not. And so it becomes very hard. And this is one of my favorite examples as to why it's very hard because you know, you know, so much of what you're talking about when you're talking about informal savings are things that move. And so it's hard, to, it's not like it's just an account where you can say, give me the balance. You're talking about things that are livestock and appliances and cars and things that are just are highly mobile and difficult to just pinpoint and say where you are. And there's, you know, a picture of a cow on a motorcycle um, as a good example of just how mobile various savings vehicles can be um, and hard to track down and figure out what to measure. Um, maybe, is that visible or no? Okay, so the... Here's the, the two other, I'm sorry, there's two other results I want to focus on. Um, one is the salience issue. So in the, in, I'm sorry, in Peru, we also had um, a sub-treatment where some of the reminders just reminded people about their future deposit, their deposits they're supposed to be making. And some of them actually said, hey, also, you know, you said you were saving for X. Just as a reminder, that's, you know, that's what we're emailing, that's what we're, not emailing you, I'm sorry, that's what we're writing you about is, the, you know, the, 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 future, the future expense that you said you were saving for. And in, this, in, in Peru, we find that all of the action on the percent saved falls into, you know, falls on that, on that sub-treatment is where all the action was. When we look at the reached savings goal by date, we do see that it's, there's no difference between 
Um, so depending on what outcome measure we find, we either find all the heterogeneity there or we find none of it. So I'm not sure how, you know, I, I take that away as being kind of strong suggestive evidence that there's something to naming the future expense um, because the, the log of the amount saved is, in my view at least, is the more important savings rather than capturing this kind of binary magic number of whether they got to the specific um, balance or not. But um, one, could, one could quibble, and that's why I would say this is more of a suggestive result. Um, there's a few, um, a few alternative things that I think are important to, to go through. Um, one, of, one, of our, one of the other things that we, that we tested, and um, I'm curious to hear a raise of hands before I tell you the results on this next treatment, is whether this is something that you think is, sounds like a cool idea or not. It's a jigsaw puzzle. There's a picture of their goal. Okay, and on each little piece of the each, you know, so it's a jigsaw puzzle. It's a picture, a picture of their goal that's been cut up into 12 pieces to make a jigsaw puzzle. And every time you make a deposit, you get a piece of that jigsaw puzzle. So it gets you, you know, it gets you that kind of physical, salient, closer to your goal feeling of actually being able to see your account your, your, your goal grow and, and get closer and closer. What do you think? Raise your hand if you think that treatment worked great or if it failed miserably. <laughs> okay, the two people in the back I think maybe know the answer. It failed miserably. We went in, we were so enthused with this and I'm so glad I finally did it this way and, and I've given this talk before and I always forget to get the show of hands first. So just to reaffirm that I wasn't like crazy too, because I was totally with you guys. I w was so excited about that treatment going in. So here's why I think it failed miserably. Um, it failed miserably because it got the timing all wrong, right? So it's, you get that as a reward for making your deposit. Right? So it wasn't in the reminder, right? So what we could have tested, but we should have tested, was sending it in the envelope along with the, the in, in Peru, when we sent them the reminder saying, next week, don't forget, you have to make your deposit, and here's a little thing that gets you a little closer to your goal, don't forget to come in, right? Then it would have really made it salient, and also probably add a little guilt factor, like now I really have to do it, because I already got my reward for doing it, so now I have to do it. But um, needless to say, we, we got that after the fact, and, and, and it, it had no effect. If I look at the point estimate, it is, oh. I didn't put the number up here, but the point estimate we actually went the wrong way. Oh, there it is, I'm sorry. Puzzle of goal, negative 0.08. Um, and the same thing with a photo, by the way. We also tried that out where they, when they open the account, they just get a photo. It's, there's no puzzles pieces to it. It's just one single photo. They put it in their house. Both of these, by the way, we also did some spot checks. And so it's not a, it was not an operational kink. We did spot checks where we went to you know, a dozen, two dozen homes, and they could tell us where their puzzle was, they could tell us where their photo was. It wasn't that they just operationally like threw the thing away. It's just the, t the so that's why we think it was the timing. But we don't, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't, um, we didn't test that part. Um, okay, so the other thing that's actually helpful, for what it's worth, even though we were really excited about that going in, the fact that it failed actually works in our favor in a little way. Just one of the stories that I think is important for us to try to separate is how much the reminders are increasing people's attention versus actually providing them some information. Actually being, let me, let me point them, paint them a different way. It's, it's a bank coming to you, sending you a message that savings is important, and that's updating your prior about how important savings is. And it's actually changing your opinion a little bit. Whether you call it changing preferences or just adding information, removing uncertainty, you can model it either way. But the point is it's, 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 it's actually informative in a way that changes your preferences. Now, if that were the case, my instinct would be that things like the photo and things like the puzzle would have that similar type effect in that it's a bank going a little over and beyond to send a signal to say, hey, the saving stuff, that goal you have is really important and we're here to help you try to reach that goal. Now obviously, that's not dispositive of that story. Uh, one could simply argue that that's an ineffective way of sending that type of information, whereas reminders is a great way of doing it. But I do think that, that failure, uh, the failure of those two to work, and the, 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 the photo was intendedly, in, originally intended as the placebo for the puzzles, but in, in, in the end, they both become effectively placebos for the reminders. Um, 
that I, I do th see as, as kind of strong suggestive evidence of attention rather than information being the key mechanism through which the reminders were working. Okay, so here's the last bit. This goes back to the hyperbolic discounting questions that Dean Yang was um, talking a lot about. Let me give you a totally different way of interpreting these questions. So we do the same ones. Um, not, as, not nearly as fancy or rigorously as, as Dean was describing from his study. We just, very simple, would you prefer 200 pesos now or 250 in the future? Then they have about three other minutes of questions that they got, and then they um, were asked the same question about 200 pesos in six months versus 250 in seven months. And then we look at the reversals. Um, and there's no money at stake. It was all hypothetical. Let me give you a totally different way of interpreting these questions. And, and again, this is going to be an as well as not in lieu of type story in the sense that you could, you could easily imagine some people treating them one way, some people treating them another. So when I ask you whether you want 200 pesos now or 250 in, in, in a month, think about me as someone who is um, inattentive. If I'm inattentive, if you ask me whether I want 250 in a month, my response might be, well, yeah, I'm not sure what I'd do with it. Um, yeah, I guess I could come up with some use for it, but I'm not sure. But 200 pesos right now, I got, I got three ideas, they're all queued up, I know what I want. So I say I, I'll take the 200 now, because it's very salient to me what I'm going to do with it. When I ask the inattentive person whether I want 200 pesos in six versus um, 250 in seven months, now what does the inattentive person do to that? Well, now they listen to that and they say, well, I don't know what I'm going to do in either time period. Six versus seven months, who really knows? I, I can't think that, f I, I'm just not, nothing's jumping out at me. But 250 is bigger than 200. So I'll do that. Or, or maybe they even answer like the financier, because they turn off their consumption hack because they're just not thinking about, they're not attending to what they're actually going to need in, in January or February. And so they, they turn on their financier hat. Well, the financier is very unambiguous how to answer this question. They should be consistent throughout. Right? So then they turn on that hat and they, of course, wait. Right? What does the attentive person do? The attentive person, particularly if they're liquidity constrained, is just matching to their cash flows and figuring out when they need the money. And so they're, they're consistent, unless their cash flows are inconsistent and they can't borrow and save. But they're not, it's not a question of attention. And so they might be, you know, the, the prediction is that they're going to answer those questions perfectly consistently, unless they have some sort of liquidity constraints and, and different expectations on cash flows. Okay, so, so the point here is that we're calling this hyperbolic. We're, call, we're referring to these people who flip as being time inconsistent. Um, but I just told you a kind of a, in a very hand-waving way a story which tells you that inattentive people should also probably flip, whereas attentive people will not flip. Okay, now, now think about re reminders. So we use these, these hyperbolic preference questions in other studies to predict a preference for commitment. But here what we're saying is, okay, if it's actually picking up a measure of attention, well, who should reminders work better on, the attentive or the inattentive? Well, they should work better on the inattentive. Suppose it was a measure of hyperbolic versus non-hyperbolic. Who should reminders work better on? Well, I have no, I have no opinion on that. Right? I, I, don't, I don't see any reason why it should work better or worse. Was, but what we find is that the reminders worked on the inattentive. The inattentive, or call them the hyperbolic, whichever way you want to label it, but the point is, in theory, I have no theory to tell you why a reminder should work well on hyperbolic individuals. So I think the, the flaw here is in being too quick to jump from that measure to calling it hyperbolic. That it's picking up some other things here too, and one of them might be just inattention. And that's what we find. And this, is the, this only comes from the Philippines. That's the only place that we had the ability to do these little mini surveys. And what we see is um, any reminder message increased savings by 8%. Um, the time inconsistent, in quotes, or inattentive, on, on general, saved much less. So that's consistent both with them being inattentive as well as being hyperbolic, whichever way you want to call it measuring. And then the interaction of the two is where we see all of the action in terms of the increase in savings. Okay, so. so that's the end of that paper. Now I'm going to talk uh, for the next four minutes about some future questions we see coming um, up and, and some kind of main takeaway thoughts and, and, and also applying this to, to loans and kind of tasks. The other, the other thing that we were keen to try to see is um, Again, on now on the loan side, using now we have a bank where there, you know, there's more reasons to repay. Right? There's a there's a bank that's that's going to come hunt you down. But we can alter the communications that banks have 
at that moment when they're trying to remind people to make their loan payments because people do still go into default. And we wanted to see as, as a couple different tests how much of it is about task management um, versus information in this case, or information or, in, in by information I'm being a little bit expansive to include kind of the, the basic relationship between the bank and the client and how, how that can be defined by the communication. This sits on an issue that is totally orthogonal to this entire talk, which is as we see more cell phone banking and mobile banking, and so we see lack of personal banking, what are, you know, is there a risk here that we're going to start seeing more moral hazard in, in banking relationships, how much of like the 99.9% you know, .9 repayment rates that we see in microcredit programs is a result of relationships. And the minute we start getting into a more agnostic, sterile, client-bank relationship without, without pers the personalization, do we see um, potential risk of increase in moral hazard. So here we did text messages to remind people to pay loans. We randomized three things. Whether we send a message the day of their loan, the payment was due the day before, two days before, positive or negative? Did we remind them of all the wonderful things if they repay their loan, or all the negative things they're gonna do if we, you know, if they fail? And whether we named the account officer or not, whether the message said, hi, this is Joe from your bank, or whether it just said, hi, this is the, the bank, and we're, you know, we're texting you to remind you to uh, make your loan payment. Um, so let's do a show, I'm curious. Quick show of hands, who thinks the day of the day matters? Task management. How much of it was about reminding them the day of rather than the day before, two days before? Was it task management to make them pay on time? Raise your hand. Was it like a prospect theory gains loss thing? Or was it the name of the bank? The banker? Or you have no idea? It was the third. The first two don't matter. It was all, all the action was on the, um, the only one that result, that mattered was whether the, the um, credit officer's name was on the actual text message. And then that, that improved repayments, nothing else did. Um, so another study we're doing that's, that's also about trying to focus, see how much of savings can be heightened by, that is really creepy when the ship goes by the way, Senda wasn't just making that up, you, it, ma it makes you feel a little dizzy. Um, um, so, um, how much of this attention issue can be generated by simple mental accounting device? Literally, just having accounts that are labeled. So in Ghana, we have a study in which we took people who were pre-existing savers with a bank, and we offered them a second account. That second account had a name on it. And that was it. That's the entire intervention. It's one of the most expensive things I've ever done, divided by the, the, the kind of the meaningfulness of what we did. If we took the ratio of those two things, it's like through the roof, right? It's all, it's all it was, is we just gave them a second account that had a name. And they chose the name, education, health, business, or other. Um, and we knew for the control group what they would have chosen. We asked, beforehand going in, we kind of asked people, like, what, if, what, what is the most important thing you say for, that you want to say for? So we know, we know that. Now we see, after one year, savings is going up 35% in aggregate for everything they're holding in the bank. Again, this is a setting where they're not holding bank, they're not holding accounts in other banks. So this is 35% more savings in, in financial institutions. I have no idea whether the money is coming from informal vehicles, but I can say that financial institution savings has gone up. And we're now in the field to look at um, expenditure data to see whether expenditures on the things that they said they were saving for go up. Okay. I'll skip these. Um, I just told you about this. So some, I think some key things that are really important in terms of further thinking about this. The first has to do with heterogeneity. This is absolutely critical. We've already looked at some of it. There's a lot more to look at. Clearly there's differences across people. Not everybody has the same flaw, the same bias, or simply the same decision-making process, right? And, and so understanding more about how to measure these types of issues, how to measure bias, and how to identify who might be prone to certain types of biases, and then understanding what solution is gonna work best for them, I think is a key area of figuring this kind of, this entire space of nudges out in, as a general statement has to be about figuring out how to measure people and then how to get the right nudge on top of those people. And that's, that's I think, the big challenges in, in this world. And, and part of what makes that hard is the within person um, changes. So I'm going to come back to that a second with the slide, which I, I suspect most people have already seen this one. You guys all seen this before? I'll come to that in a second. So the second is on this timing issue. I think, and, and it has to understanding how much of attention is it about task management and, and, the, and the daily routine of things, um, and, um, and, and rather than just like some sort of generic, you know, 
monolithic um, attention that we can just say, ah, you either attend this thing or not. The separation of information from attention is also um, um, a critical area that I think we need to understand more about, particularly when we see more and more type of messaging and communications and media and marketing being used to influence behavior. Um, Variety is also another key issue which I think we, we lack clear information on. When do you want more variety? When do you want less? When do you want it so that people know exactly what the reminder is? They don't need to read it again. It, they just they know it and that it, there it is. Versus when do you need it to change every week so that they keep reminding? I mean, if you think about advertising, if advertisers are, are simply trying to remind you to consume their goods, then they're you know, they're changing it up all the time. What are they, you know, why? What, what is the model of behavior that explains why marketers do it that way? And lastly is the depletion point. The depletion point that Sendel made in his talk is obviously important. If we're gonna get people to attend to this, what are they not attending to? What's the trade-off here we're making from a, from a welfare perspective? So these are my closing thoughts. So this is the slide which um, I suspect a lot of people have seen before. So it's this great slide that has two basic points that, you know, um, that out of context, it's really hard to predict what people are gonna do. You know, if we had to write a model of these people, we of course tell, you know, they're exercisers, they're on the way to a gym, what are they gonna do? Stairs or escalator, they're gonna do the stairs, that's our model, but yet it didn't fly, that's not what they did. The second point of this is nudges. How, well, how easy would it be to just put a little gate up in front of that escalator? That's all you'd have to do is a little gate, and that little gate, or a little rope would get them to probably take the stairs, right? It'd be very simple, they could move the gate. It wouldn't say gate closed, right? It'd just be a little gate. And that, that would be a nice simple nudge if, we want, if, we want, if that was our goal, is to get them to use the stairs. So it's easy to move people, we think, and it's also that. But nudges can go bad. So here's my example of social nudge for bad. <laughs> so, you know, here's a bunch of people that have a choice between stairs and escalator. Um, and they're just, you know, they're sheep. They're just, they're just following the people in front of them, social mimicry. Um, and there they are, on cue, waiting to get onto the escalator rather than, and these are the short stairs, this is the Tokyo subway, so I think, I'm pretty sure those are short stairs. This is not, this is not like the tube in London where you might have 350 steps. Um, so, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and close just by saying that, I, that we do need to think about welfare as well when we do this. I think one of the, um, let me just say this top point, which is that when we do think about increasing savings, um, we, in most situations, I think, fail to talk about where the money's coming from. And, and this is a mistake. It's hard to do on a micro level um, when, the saving, when the changes we're seeing are small. Um, but we can't, we, if we forget to do this and we forget to at least think about this, we could be making grave mistakes. So does it come from, I mean, here's your four choices, right? It's it. I mean, we can, I, mean, I, I think, I, I, unless I'm forgetting something, I think we got it all. It's either lower consumption, lower savings elsewhere, higher debt, or higher income if the savings went to investment which led into profits, and that just has to do with the timing in which you measure things, right? But that's it. It's, and you could argue that it's really just the top three, but it, if, you know, it has to be from somewhere. And one of my fears in a lot of the work is that it, it's the higher debt. Right, particularly when we see a lot of the way the microfinance world is organized in developing countries, where you see micro lenders thinking it's a good thing to try to encourage people to save. Um, and and this, is, this is a real problem. And when we just look at increased savings as the outcome measure and call this a good thing and fail to realize that this might mean that they actually have more debt than they would have otherwise, and that's actually a bad thing, if the interest rate on the debt was higher than the savings, then our welfare has gone down, but yet we did this intervention, we had this under savings problem, we see savings go up and we think that's a good thing. And that's a real problem. So we need to take into account, we need to think hard about where the money is coming from when we do these studies on under savings. Thanks to both deans. Uh, we have uh, time now for uh, questions and uh, comments. Uh, I'll kick off with one question, uh, which is on the heterogeneity point, <coughs> to uh, uh, Dean Yang, is whether uh, how the behavior differed across uh, different wealth categories, if you have that information, uh, uh, poorer farmers, uh, less poor farmers, did it differ? And similarly, in a way, uh, to uh, uh, Dean Carlin as well, whether how wealth difference is affected some of these behavioral points that you were making. Uh, okay, so let's uh, go uh, Trevor? Uh, for the 
provide the, uh, the uh, you use the, for the shock variables. Uh, I'm not sure you only use the family member death as a control variable. Do you have the information on the fam uh, death in the village? Do you talk about social networks in Africa, in China, in Asia countries? Funeral is a big thing. If there's a family, somebody died in the village, people need to send a gift. This is a big spending for everyone else in the village. So maybe you can use that to control for social networks. Just one thought. For the second uh, presentation, it, it seems to assume high savings always good. But if you look at China and many East Asia countries, there's over saving problem and then have spillover effect on the US. So if all the developed countries follow your advice, save well out, maybe there's a negative welfare impact on the US because they will buy more treasury bills, lower the interest rate, maybe cause more financial problem in the US. Just <laughs> some like a thought. Thank you. And two reminders. <laughs> two reminders in China. So, uh, Nava? Um, just, just a question for Dean Yang. Um, I was really struck by your spousal preferences results, and particularly by the fact that they were symmetric between men and women. So I was wondering about the decision making within the household in Malawi. Um, it seems surprising that, for example, for the little I know about this region, um, I know that there's tribal variation, but um, men are the ones that are often making the decision about inputs into agriculture, for example, and other things. So if they're making the plan and then they're changing it, it seems strange that it would be their wives that would be supporting that, I mean, pushing for that. Um, and so I would have expected to see a difference, or at least something that would have been driven by differences in bargaining power or something like that. So what do you think is, is going on there? Uh, one more and then we'll, we'll pass up to respond here. Yeah. Yes, um, I have a question on a small question on the uh, first dean, on on, um, and that's the following: Would it make sense to look at the interaction effects between, uh, for example, present bias and and the shock variable? Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great so Ravi, uh, the. Um, uh, in terms of whether the whether revisions are higher for the rich versus the poor, revisions towards the present, um, the uh, the it actually turns out that um, wealthier people do less revision towards the present. Um, uh, so you know the, the the coefficient on the wealth variable is negative. So that's I think that's what um, one might expect that wealthier people um, basically. Uh, don't give don't give in as much to the temptation to uh, to shift money towards the present, and they they they, they stay with their original allocations, um, <clears throat> or or they may even they may even be moving money towards more towards the later period to take advantage of the the, the rate of return. Um, uh, Sabo's question about uh, whether we have uh, data on uh, other deaths in the village. We actually, unfortunately, didn't collect those data on sort of deaths of others in the village. But I would say that, you know, given that we don't find any effect of deaths of someone in the immediate family, I mean, that's actually quite quite striking. Um, if we did have data on, on deaths of other people in the village, it would be very surprising if, if those events affect al affected allocations and deaths of someone in your family didn't. Um, the uh, uh, Nava's question is uh, uh, gets to, you know, one of the, I think, uh, most not puzzling, but you know, striking, perhaps striking results in 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 this uh, in our paper, which is that I didn't get to discuss it, but basically um, the effect uh, of uh, spousal um, pressure is the same, or almost the same, for men and women uh, in our sample. Um, I will say that the the point estimate is actually slightly larger for women than for men, but not substantially so, and the difference is not is you know far from statistically significant. Frankly, I don't I don't know if we have a, a good uh, answer to that question. Um, I think uh, you know going into it, I would have not been surprised if you know a priori I would have not been surprised if the effect only showed up for women and not for men. Um, that would have been I think you know consistent with most people's uh, prior. Um, and uh, this is, I, you know, all I'll say is this is the first time a study like, you know, this exactly like this has been done, and, and uh, um, I think future work should continue to test this and, and perhaps uh, probe on that result uh, to see, uh, uh, you know, how robust it is to different, uh, uh, you know, subset of the, subsets of the population, et cetera. Um, 
And uh, Yuka's question about interacting the, uh, all these effects with the present bias is actually a great idea. We should, we should try that. We haven't done it yet. Um, so the, it's been a while, so I hesitate to say this too definitively, but I'm fairly certain we, have, we, didn't, we did not have heterogeneity on, on wealth. It is the case that I wouldn't say we have like, the, the widest variation on the planet. Right? We don't have wealthy, we don't have the very poor. Um, and we also don't have full-blown household surveys. So our measures of wealth are very crude kind of poverty scorecard type things, five question type, type, type things. But your question has make me, does make me want to go back and look because it has been so long. Especially linking it to... Uh, to <coughs> Sentinel's talk. No, 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 no. It was funny. I actually had that thought when Sentinel was talking that... that um, um, Chuckles, the undersaving. Oh, I didn't write that. I'm oh, sorry, I never oh, figured out the question. Uh, Jack asked a question about oversaving, you know. If, uh, all, the fo all our focus seems to be on undersaving, but in some countries there's oversaving. So would you want to send fewer reminders? Is the question. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, um, you know, there, well, I wouldn't send fewer reminders, but I would send as reminders to consume. <laughs> um, you know, I do... I do wonder in those settings, do we really think that there were individual, I mean, I, I, I want to go back to that very first slide I put up, like what's, what's causing us to say there's oversaving? Is it, do we really think there are individual failures that individuals are oversaving? Or do we think that just the, the, you know, the consequence at the macro level is not what we'd like it to be? And that's a, and that's a very different beast. Um, you know, that, that implies that there's some, you know, public finance solution to, to the problem but that it's not, um, that on an individual basis, that's just that those are their preferences. Um. Good. Uh, so another round, yes. Tongi. Thanks. This is a question for Dean Yang. Although it, it kind of relates to, uh, to uh, uh, some of the stuff that, uh, that Dean Cullen said. I was wondering, so in your experiments, the size of the plan is fixed across, across all, all individuals. Size of what, sorry? The, pl the size of the plan, the, the, the amount of money that people uh, are located across. Yes. Uh, across. And so, but so I was wondering whether in, your one, in some of your earlier slides uh, on fertilizer and uh, decision re reversals, whether you did find that decision reversals depend on the size of the plan itself, which, which is an endogenous variable, depends on your needs, depends on your your forecasting capacity of your, your liquidity, uh, liquidities, et cetera. And so, I mean, I find that in, in, uh, in agriculture especially, uh, you see people sowing a lot, of, a lot of land, yet they don't have the capacity to, to hire the necessary labor to weed it a couple of months later, et cetera. So, so I guess my question boils down to, do you, in terms of heterogeneity, do you also find uh, decision reversals that depend on the size of the commitment, so to say? Okay. Any further questions, comments, observations? Yes, we have Marcus. It's a very serious <clears throat> remark, which is that if if these reminders really um, reminders to consume would would kind of be the solution, I think you should probably sell these ideas to the to the treasuries of today, because with constrained treasuries expansive fiscal policies aren't possible, but you may be able to solve the counter-cyclical <laughs> macroeconomic policy problem by, by just sending text messages to people. <laughs> I mean, there is an argument that that's what advertising is all about. <laughs> it's not, yeah, I mean, we'd have to... You do it counter-cyclically. Yeah, well, but, I mean, it, yeah, it, 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 in that sense, it is a puzzle that the advertisers will, are going to uh, cut back their budgets and the, you would think it should be the opposite. Well, the government should subsidize advertising then during recessions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There might be too much spillover there. It might be that, that there might actually be a public, um, a public goods problem, you could argue. Like, you know, why doesn't Coke send reminders to buy Coke if they think Pepsi is going to get all the benefits? Or at least half the benefits, you know? Okay. Any other... Uh, Malta, yes. Malta, and then, uh, uh, and then behind, and then we'll come to you. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot. I've got a um, question to the first Dean, uh, which is, are we really only measuring time preferences, or are we also measuring trust? Uh, 
Um, if you came and offered me $20 tomorrow morning or $30 in 31 days, um, I wouldn't know if I could trust you 31 days down the road. I would probably say, well, I'll hedge my bets. I'll take $10 tomorrow at breakfast. I know I can trust you on that one. Um, and then the other, I'll take $15 down, down the road in, in, in 31 days. But I wouldn't want to trust you 31 days uh, down the road. Um, that calculation changes if you ask me 61 days and 91 days, because if I can trust you for 61 days, I might as well trust you for 91 days. Um, so it's easier to track you down tomorrow. So I might want to be sure I get a little bit of the money that the researchers promised me, rather than rely on that promise that they will come back at some point in, in time in the future. I'm not saying we don't measure preferences of time, but we might also measure trust. And you might have the same on, on a bigger level that, that if you ask people to save in Peru or in the US, you ask them to trust a bank. And you, you would ask US consumers to trust Citibank or Bank of America. You ask them to trust that the US dollar is still going to be worth something in, in, in a few months or in a few years. So maybe that, that's sort of an angle that you could, could take at the results as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, Could you say your name? And, uh, my name is Aurelia Kamzora. Um, I come from Tanzania. I teach at Mzungu University. Um, I have seen this uh, issue of uh, saving, and uh, I follow my fellow from China who were talking about the challenge between over saving and under saving. And saving as a variable, uh, it can be discussed at macro level or micro level. But the way I saw the presenter was talking about micro level. And this micro level has a challenge also. Now come to Tanzania where I can take an example of a Maasai. Maasai are the best saver in the world. They save their, uh, their, their, their cattle and they never send their children to school because they don't like to sell their cattle. And they have a lot, a lot of cattle until now they are even um, over, 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 <laughs> overheaded in Tanzania in the way we can't even know how to control them because they are powerful. That's another way of saving behavior. And we have seen an uh, over saving in, in, in Japan sometimes, somewhere in the 1980s, 90s, where there was a problem of, of, of recession because of over saving. And we saw the credit crunch, which we experienced what happened. Now, I think the economists must go back to the drawing board and see which model can explain better the saving and the economics. At the same time, maybe we, we put in the issue of institutional behavior, the way the institutions affected the saving behavior and the impact um, at, the, at, at institutional level at the different, if we look at different countries, different cultural contexts, and the impact of this over or under saving. Thank you. Uh, yes, and then we'll have a, a response after uh, Catherine. Uh, this is for Ding Yang. So I'm just um, thinking at the um, sort of the similarity that you find in the spousal preferences um, uh, for uh, female and male. And I'm wondering if you looked at, and I know this is not the interest in the paper, but in some of the stuff that you did, uh, to look at whether the spousal uh, preferences influence the initial choice, um, versus taking it today versus taking it tomorrow. And then um, compare, I, I'm thinking that comparing that versus comparing the revision might shed some light on whether um, it is that spouses consider their uh, their spouse's preferences into their choices versus uh, which would you know you could observe from the initial or uh, the effect of the initial choice versus um, if it only has an effect in the revision then maybe it, it is a little bit more consistent with the appropriate uh, well the you know the pressure and the uh, opportunity for you know appropriation of resources or something like that on uh, that story. Okay, so Dean and then Dean. So, go ahead. Um, I, you know, I think you know, I, I, you know, I have mixed feelings about how to think sometimes about the influence of culture on on you know kind of aggregate savings levels because 
you know, it's not the case that um, you know, most of the biases that we that we typically think about that are usually put into predictions about how much people are going to save and, and understanding um, is is not you know there's none of these that I, I've never heard anybody say oh I think this particular culture is particularly attentive or inattentive and this particular culture is more you know hyperbolic or not right um, so. You know, but clearly there is something different about certain cultures and the emphasis they put. And so I think my sense on the way to do this, and this goes back to a little bit to the, I think the, the talk Carla Hoff was, was gave and one of the questions posed to her was, you know, I think some of this can be embedded by just thinking about the underlying discount rates. Um, and you know, and what's what's driving those, right? We talk about them like individual heterogeneity, but of course, there's obviously cultural heterogeneity there too, in the way people talk about how much they should value the future versus current, and, and maybe that's just part of, you know, that that should be, that's part of what we're going to be measuring. And when we think about cross-country studies that try understanding things, you know, that we're going to see some some differences in some of those underlying parameters. And that's going to explain aggregate levels. That, that doesn't mean when we go from one place to another that we're going to be more or less likely to see certain biases. That you can just have you know, a higher level of discount rates or a lower level of discount rates, but you still see some reversals. And you see, see attention and inattention within and across societies. Um, so to me, that's the kind of one way of, one way of thinking about it. Um, you know, I'm willing to bet that if we go into the Maasai, we're still going to see some individuals who, are, who, who undersave relative to what their stated preferences are. Um, that, that would be my prediction. Obviously, I don't know. I haven't done it. So. Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, Dongi had a, a very interesting question about whether, um, and you know, something that we didn't do, but uh, which I think would be very interesting to do, whether uh, revisions uh, towards the present would be, would be uh, larger if the size of the, uh, the overall allocatable pool was larger. Um, I think that would be extremely interesting to test. Uh, we can certainly start to get it. We haven't actually done that with our observational data, you know, the data on whether, you know, people actually revising their fertilizer decisions that I, that I showed earlier. We haven't really done much with those data other than calculating those summary statistics, but I think that would be very interesting from an ob observational standpoint. Uh, and also could be, you know, the, the basis of, a, of an experiment. I mean, one could actually imagine giving people randomly allocated pot sizes to see whether the results would, would vary. So I think that's a very uh, interesting uh, idea worth pursuing. Um, uh, there was, you know, so the question about um, whether our, our measure of present bias could actually be measuring trust, um, that's, a, that's an excellent question uh, and one that we've given a great deal of thought to. Um, and it actually, you know, the, 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 uh, the issue, just to recapitulate, is um, whether individuals might look present biased um, uh, simply because they don't trust the institution that's handing out the money, um, you know, on these, on these pre-specified dates. Uh, I think that that concern is highest if one has a design, and this has actually come up in, in, in you know, previous work on this topic, Andrea and Springer, um, um, you know, deal, deal with this as well. Um, uh, that, com that concern is highest when, when um, the sooner payout date in the near period is today, as in right now, once you tell me how much you want now, you'll get the money now from me who is sitting in front of you. Um, we, and Andrew and Springer do the same thing. We try to uh, deal with that by making sure that the payment um, context is identical across all the dates in question. So days 1, 31, 61, and 91 in our context um, all involve the person having to go to the nearest town to an office that we specify and presenting a voucher. So there is no, basically we get rid of any possibility that if you allocate money to today in the near period, you'll get the money right now with certainty. Um, Andrea and Springer have a different setup that achieves, we think, the same thing. Um, that's, that's what we do to deal with that. I think, um, you know, in, in all honesty, uh, one could still raise the issue that even given that constancy of the payment context across payment dates, one might still think that there was a higher probability of getting the payment tomorrow when I go into town as opposed to 31, 61, or 91 days when I go into town, and we can't deal with that. Um, uh, I will say that, that uh, we should have some credibility as a payment organization because we've inter interacted with these individuals before. Um, this is actually, you know, probably, you know, the, not the first time that we've surveyed these individuals, and I, I think they have some uh, uh, confidence that we are, we are actually a, a legitimate uh, organization coming to survey them. 
Um, so that's, that's all that I can say about it, but it's a very important thing that we need to address uh, in, this, uh, in this work. There's, an, there's another way, too, which is, um, d I mean, a lot of lab people don't like this, but make them hypothetical. And it does, I think, arguably, well, make, the, make if you're right. right. I'm, not, I'm not saying the trade-off is worth making, but uh, there is a trade-off to be made there that I think is, is not discussed enough, which is, if there's no money at stake, then, yeah. then it's really just an abstract question. And now, about when you prefer to have the cash flow come in, um, and yeah. they, they might just abstract from the trust issue completely if it's if there's no money at the stake. Uh, that, I think that's a, that's a good point. Having said that, one might imagine that people bring the decision heuristics that they normally use in a real world situation in answering that hypothetical question. Uh, exactly. In which case, right. then it'd still be there. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's the, the hope is that by making it hypothetical, they abstract from the logistics of the payment and actually yeah. focus on what you want them to focus right. on. Right, right. Now I wanted to get in a quick comment here. Yeah, just, just that, you know, in the, in, the, in the, if that's what we did in the seed paper, and we tried to kind of create, <laughs> imagine yourself in this situation, we had a whole setup so that they really felt, even though it's hypothetical, that they were in that situation, but precisely to overcome the, the trust problem. But then in my own experiments, we did basically post-dated checks to overcome the trust issue, and that was very effective with the same thing. Yeah. So yep. um, and there was one one last question from Carolina uh, on um, whether whether spousal preferences influence initial choice. Um, we actually haven't looked at that, and I, yeah, that'd be very interesting to look at. So that's a nice idea. Uh, one thing I should say, just about the design, it wasn't physically possible for spouses to influence the initial choice directly um, because we interviewed the spouses separately. But you know, I think your point is valid that you know. Just knowing one's spouse's preferences might have influenced uh, the initial yeah, allocations. Sort of like the idea that you know you're so, yeah, um, really the defense on being yeah. the other spouse. Sure. We did have one parallel, by the way, which is in the seed paper. You know, the time pre the time and consistent preferences predicted commitment take up much more strongly for women than men. For for men, it's almost zero. You're you're saying one consistency with what we find? Yeah. I mean, you don't have women. You had just men, um, right? In this study, yeah, we actually um, we have we have men and women in. Uh, no, but in the no, the first part. There was one part you put up that where we were consistent, with, where there was which I was struck by because we never really understood our gender result very well. We were never oh, the, we uh, never really felt like we nailed like a Y on that one. You might be you might be referring to. Um, the other oh, the commitment other saving study that we that's did where we looked about. at demand for commitment, where that sample was mostly 96% yeah, men. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, and we didn't find the same effect you found, which was for women, so that could be one reason why we're not finding the same result. Right. Yep. right no, that was the same result, is what I'm saying. You're saying... You found no, no correlation between men and take up, which is what we found. Which is what you found, correct. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Our effect is just that we had enough women that the average effect was there. Right, right. But when you look at the heterogeneity, it matches yours perfectly. Right, right, oh, exactly. Okay. okay. Good. Well, I have two, two things to do. Uh, uh, firstly, to uh, call Finn to the front to close the conference. But before that, let us thank our speakers for a great session.